Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Seoul International Book Fair uh, 2021. Uh, my name is Jae Ho Gang, a professor at communication department at Seoul National University in Seoul here, South Korea. Well, welcome to our panelists today. Uh, we have three panelists, uh, Jose Borghino, Trasvin Jitri Charak, and Michael Haley. So welcome everyone. And it's especially amid this the COVID, that's our topic, why copyright matters today amid this COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, uh, we are not able to have you here in Seoul due to the COVID-19, but the Oh, we are making the best of it while having a the uh, online book fairs and uh, some uh, seminars uh, through this uh, uh, this online conference as well. So hope we can make uh, some the most of it <clears throat> during this very challenging time. And hope, of course, so you guys are all staying safe there. Um, we have uh, an order of the presentation today from Jose and followed by Traspi and Michael. So I will uh, introduce each speaker uh, in just before you uh, read into your paper, okay? So our first uh, speaker today is Jose Borghino. He has been Secretary General of the International Publishers Association in Geneva since September 2015. He joined the IPA as policy director in 2013 and was in charge of policy development, organizing the Prix Voltaire, IPA's Freedom to Publish it Prize, and managing the IPA's uh, activities in the educational publishing sector, including the annual What Works Conference and the Educational Publishers Forum. This a forum is with question mark what works, so I should say what works. <laughs> so every time that I quote it, I should say what works with the question mark. So before joining the IPA, Jose was a manager industry representation at the Australian Publishers Association. He has been executive director of the Australian Society of Authors, a lecturer in literary journalism and creative industries at the University of Sydney, and editor of the online news magazine newmatilda.com. Well, Jose held uh, senior positions at the Literature Board of the Australian uh, Council and was the founding editor of Editor's Review. He has been a very uh, good friend for this whole uh, international book fair for a while as well. So I'd like to welcome him again. So Jose, please. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, it's a very important uh, topic, and I'm very pleased to be here with my fellow speakers. So if you want me, I can start straight away. If you put the, the slides up, please. We're gathered here to talk about why copyright matters amidst the, copy, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today, what I'd like to do is talk about the IPA and copyright. Um, why copyright matters in general, not just during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about exclusive rights um, and what the copy wrongs are doing uh, to try to undermine copyright at the moment, uh, talk about piracy, and then give a conclusion. Uh, next slide, please. So quickly, um, a background about the IPA. Uh, we were established in 1896. To, this year is our 125th anniversary. There will be parties happening um, uh, throughout the year, so keep your eyes open. Uh, we contain at the moment 86 associations of publishers from 71 countries. They in their turn represent thousands of individual publishers. Um, and we estimate that the um, um, consumers around the world are serviced by these published to the tune of um, 5.6 million, uh, sorry, 5.6 billion customers. So, um, uh, next slide, please. The IPA's uh, pillars um, of uh, policy are, are twofold. One is uh, copyright, 
um, and the other one is uh, freedom to publish. These two pillars, in my mind at least, are intimately intertwined because copyright is a major impulse and guarantee for freedom to publish. But that's another story. We can talk about that another time. Copyright has been central to the IPA since our inception 125 years ago because it is the essential foundation for all publishing, enabling all the actions that publishers undertake on behalf of creators. Basically, publishers are the financial engines of the copyright machine. We pay advances to authors, offset against future royalties to give those authors the security and time to write. Publishers pay editors, illustrators, typesetters, and designers for their work before a single copy of a book is printed and available in the marketplace. Publishers pay printers and app or web designers and marketers long before a book has been distributed or displayed. They negotiate a cut of a book's retail price with bookshops, websites, and aggregators before anyone has bought a copy. In short, publishers take the financial and reputational risk of investing in a commodity that they believe and hope will be loved or useful or both and therefore brought to readers. There are three main copyright editors that we focus on and they are um, uh, exclusive rights, exceptions and limitations and enforcement. Um, next slide, please. So the upside, believe it or not, there's an upside to what's happened in 2020 and the first part of 2021. The upside is that um, uh, there's been an accelerated shift to digital business models due to bookshop close closures. Copyright has always been essential for, publish for the publishing industry and COVID has underlined that importance and the flexibility inherent in copyright legal frameworks. The COVID-19 pandemic aggravated the needs and threats. Publishers had to quickly adapt to respond to the needs of consumers who became digitally rooted in the developed world. The pandemic also accelerated digital business models with bookshops closed Many publishers turned to digital formats like ebooks or audiobooks to continue to serve their audiences. Some markets, remarkably, have shown a significant increase in digital sales. For example, in the UK, digital sales grew by 12%, representing £3 billion in 2020, according to a study by the PA UK. Next slide, slide please. So inevitably that was the upside, there is a downside. The downsides are that there have been increases in the digital piracy of books reported by many of the IPA's members. While in 2020, digital licensing did not compensate for the overall drop in sales due to the closure of bookshops, there seems to be some positive progress in 2021. And then finally, the copy wrongs attacks on, on copyright I'll deal with later. Next slide, please. So last year, um, uh, Badur al Qasimi put forward a, a survey to members and uh, put together um, a report called From Response to Recovery. Basically, what this report says about the impact of COVID-19 is that, that those publishing markets around the world that survived or even thrived during the pandemic had a number of essential uh, prerequisites. They had support from their governments, which in many cases designated publishers and bookshops as essential industries. And they had good digital infrastructure and mature financial services. Those markets without these features struggled. So as the digital marketplace has become even more important, modern copyright laws are even more essential now. Next slide, please. Why are they more important? Because digital licensing requires an appropriate and updated set 
of exclusive rights. Next slide, please. The key right in the digital marketplace is now the right of making available, which is part of the right of communication to the public. Adding to the rights of reproduction and distribution, which are the basis of uh, to enable sales of physical books. Although this new right was set out in an international level in 1996 with the approval of the White Bear Copyright Treaty, there are many countries that have not yet updated their laws to implement it. Next slide, please. So now we're looking at what the um, copy wrongs campaigns um, are doing uh, at the moment that threaten publishers and threaten the copyright framework. There are pressure groups active all around the world and IPA is trying to deal with them um, in a supranational level at WIPO and other places connected to the UN, but also nationally or regionally. And I can mention South Africa, Namibia, the EU as places where these battles are being fought. Basically, what these copy wrong groups are doing is hindering and restricting copyright protection. They want to open um, more um, and broader exclu um, uh, uh, places where copyright can be uh, used or undermined. So there's increased pressures from these groups um, around the world, especially on exceptions and limitations. Next slide, please. Proposals to hinder and restrict copyright protection through overbroad exceptions and limitations include campaigns for, for example, adoption of the fair use provisions in, in jurisdictions that don't have the necessary judiciary means to ensure an accurate application of this open-ended US style exception. There are also uh, adoption of overbroad specific exceptions, such as the TDM exception that enables commercial use of published works without providing for contractual override. And then educational exceptions that enable schools and students to make and distribute digital copies of educational materials, including those that are already commercially available. At the World Intellectual Property Organization, IPA participates in committee meetings relevant to copyright, notably the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, the SCCR. This is an international forum where issues of exceptions and limitations have been discussed for more than a decade without consensus so far that normative action or rulemaking action is necessary at the international level. And we'll, we'll hopefully keep it that way. Nevertheless, threats to the integrity of copyright protection systems continue to arise at national levels, prompting the IPA to advocate against overbroad exceptions and limitations. Next slide, please. Many countries, many of our members have reported a rise in book piracy during the COVID pandemic, both, both in terms of hard copies, but especially in um, virtual piracy. For example, and it's only one example, Colombia, um, the IPA's member in Colombia reported recently that about 7,786 infringing copies of books or titles were taken down from platforms such as Mercado Libre, Facebook, or Instagram. Many of these countries, um, especially in Africa and Latin America, lack the, freedom, the legal frameworks to tackle online infringement um, efficiently. Next slide, please. So what we need for appropriate infringe, infringement enforcement provisions are that they make copyright infringe, infringement actionable and copyright protection effective. There's no, there's no use having copyright if you can't enforce it. So appropriate infringement and enforcement provisions are key to making copyright infringement actionable and 
copyright protection effective. Many countries still don't have those legal frameworks, as I said uh, in the previous slide. Next slide, please. So examples of what the IPA prioritizes as necessary mechanisms in uh, national legal frame frameworks is a requirement for notice and stay down systems as obligations of internet service providers following an initial take notice and take down notification by the copyright owners. We uh, advocate clear rules for expeditious notice and take or stay down procedures, including reasonable requirements that do not impose undue burdens on rights holders. We require requirements for effective repeat infringer, infringer policies to prevent pirates from returning to platforms without penalty under a, drift, a different name. Said policies include imposing enhanced penalties against repeat infringers, but also against infringers that make available large amounts of infringing content. We advocate rules for site blocking for copyright infringing websites, including dynamic injunctions that allow blocking new URLs used by the same infringers. We advocate establishing an administrative authority specialized in assessing site blocking requests and we advocate appropriate limitations of liability for ISPs and appropriate criminal sanctions for all infringers. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, what I've tried to show is that copyright is an essential foundation of publishing. The copyright evolves to make technologies to match, sorry, technological change and exclusive rights enable publishers to operate and adapt. Copy wrong activists are trying to undermine copyright through overboard, overbroad exceptions and limitations, and we are fighting against that. And effective enforcement mechanisms are necessary for publishers to adapt to digital confidently. Thank you very, very much. Thanks very much, Jose, as usual. Uh, it gives uh, a very informative and what's going on in the real business as well, especially in terms of uh, digital licensing issues. So we would like to come back to that and how we can sure. catch up these uh, new, new uh, issues as well. Sure. Thanks again. Uh, let's just move on to the next speaker. Uh, Trust me, Ajita Chara. She's from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Uh, she founded Silkworm Books, a general independent publisher of English language books in Thailand and Southeast Asia. In 2005, Traspin founded Mekong Press Foundation to support publishing activities and establish a network in the greater Mekong sub region. Uh, Traspin uh, served in local and international publishing uh, communities. Uh, they included uh, the International Publishers Association's Executive Committee from 2012 to 2017, a focal person, UNESCO Bangkok World Book Capital City in 2013. Also, she chaired the organizing committee, the 30th IPA Congress Bangkok 2015. Also, she was an advisor, the Publishers and Booksellers Association of Thailand from 2009 to 15, and again, 2019 to 2021. Uh, the IPA's Freedom to Publish Committee was uh, one of uh, the organizations she worked for, and she was the Secretary General of the ASEAN Book Publishers Association 2020 to 2020. 21. Uh, we are very delighted to have her today. Uh, and then, so trust me, please do your presentation. Yes, thank you, Jay. Um, it's a pleasure to join you today. Um, as Jose had sort of provide background of the situation of copyright and copy wrong and what happened during the pandemic, um, the situation in ASEAN country, it's um, quite different. Uh, could we have the slides, please? 
So the first that I just want to give a little background on the what is ASEAN, you know, not that we misspelled it, but when it was start up, we all misspelled it. Um, it's uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations established in 1967 and have 10 members. They are Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Brunei, Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar, and Cambodia. Next, please. You know, um, tell me God, the Singaporean diplomat compared the similarity of ASEAN and EU that both found to promote peace and seek integrate the economies to, of their member states to a single market and production platform. So, Ko said that EU and ASEAN share commitment to human rights, but let on this human rights thing, let's discuss it in other time and other places. But the differences is, ASEAN is an intergovernment organization and ASEAN does not have a common currency and have no plan to have one. ASEAN has the ASEAN Inter-Parliamentary Assembly, which only the power of morals suggestion. And ASEAN has relatively small and weak secretariat. ASEAN takes all its decision by consensus. So this is a huge difference with EU. Next slide, please. And ASEAN Book Publisher Association found in 2005, it has seven publisher association members. They are the Indonesian, which is IGAPI, and Cambodian Publisher Association, Malaysian Book Publisher Association, Myanmar Publisher and Bookseller Association, Philippines Education and Publishers Association. Philippines have a few associations. And the Publisher and Bookseller Association of Thailand and Vietnam Publisher Association. And then a few associated members like Indonesian um, University Press Associations. Next slide, please. And each country have an agency responsible for copyright. But um, what I would like to point out here is very interesting. You can see that in Cambodia, it's a it's a Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts. In Indonesia, it's the Ministry of Law and Human Rights. And in Laos, it's Ministry of Science and Technology. And Malaysia is, I think it's an independent organization. I'm not sure which ministry it is. And Myanmar is under Ministry of Education. Next slide, please. And Philippines have its own um, Bureau of Copyright and Related Rights. Um, Singapore, it's under Intellectual Property Office of Singapore. And Thailand is under Ministry of Commerce. And Vietnam is um, have a Copyright Office of Vietnam. So you can see that the structure in each country in ASEAN is different. And this is affected how they put an effort and policy into practice. Next slide, please. The copyright violation and piracy on books in the region are pretty straightforward. I mean, they just photocopy and bound into the book form, sell it or give it away, or mostly sell it, you know, copy almost look alike scan the book and upload it on the website and share it or sells it. Review the book on YouTube. When I said review, I will show you how they did it, how they do it um, later on. And or just offset the book, like printing it and sell it cheaply online. Oh, next slide, please. So this is one of my own book. Um, we do, we knew it. I mean, the author and I knew it right away that once we publish it, it will be pirate in Myanmar right away. So we arranged with the people in Myanmar to translate it and plan to release it at the same time. However, we forgot that we, we had licensed this book in, um, into Europe and UK. So it was scanned and shared it on WhatsApp in India. Forget about India. <laughs> I forgot about India. <laughs> what we should do something. Next slide, please. 
So this one is the YouTube one. Um, could you please turn it on? And now? is exactly what they do with children's book. They would say we reviewed it, but actually they turn on and read the whole books. And you know, so you don't need to buy a book. So you just turn this on and, and show it. But this is just coincidentally, this book called Mommy, Mommy. And today is Mother Days in Thailand. So it just sort of coincidentally um, <laughs> perfect for piracy. Next slide, please. Happy Mother's Day in Thailand anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So um, about offset the book and sell it online. Um, actually, last year, um, Bangkok has a breakout. So we didn't have um, a book fair, the on-ground on book fair like we used to. So we organized the online book fair, which went very well, successfully. So we share our experience with our friends in ASEAN Book Publisher Association. So we explained them the whole process. So um, our colleagues from other countries got excited and everyone have the online book fair, online fairs and to sell the book and promote the book. But um, they're working with um, the e-commerce, Chinese owned e-commerce called Shopee. I don't know whether um, you have it in Korea or not, you might. But um, Shopee is quite big in, in Southeast Asia and it's like a marketplace. The, what happened was all the, pirate copied illegal copy from Indonesia was sell it in Malaysia because uh, many, many Malaysian read Bahasa Indonesia. So first it came out that way. And um, with this marketplace, um, um, next slide please. The Malaysian Book Publisher Association have to make a, a real protest send a letter protesting to this marketplace. And of course they're taking all this pirate book down, but once you, you close one and another one just pop up. So it's remained a headache. And it's increasingly, last year is all the Indonesian pirate copies. But this year they said it has the international bestseller in English pirate copy available online through this uh, marketplace. So next slide, please. This is what happened in Thailand. A few weeks ago, we were shocked because the government libraries, I mean, in the provincial, scanned the book and put it up without publisher permissions. So the publishers called the association, there are a few of them and say that what, what should we do? Should we take them to court? You know, this is the under Ministry of Education. First, we thought we should file a lawsuit to the ministry, but then afterward, we still have to work with the ministry. So um, Pubat organized the meeting, asked to meet the ministers, you know, so we got to, meet with the deputy um, minister at the Ministry of Education. Next slide, please. So this is a real formal. <laughs> you can see that this whole site is Pubat, um, you know, all this in the blue jacket is Pubat's board members. And this size is the ministry people and the deputy minister is on, in the middle. So we complain. And it turned out that the librarians, a few of them, um, did it out of ignorance. They didn't, the ministry have no ideas what their people were doing in the province. So they agreed to, took now immediately and warn everyone, but 
we found out that the ministry never actually inform or provide any information about copyright, what they shouldn't do, what they're not allowed to do at all to their librarians around the country. So um, the association put that offer them that, okay, if we have a joint training or something, you know, so they agree and the response was positive. So next slide, please. So the following week we have, you see the libraries, state owned libraries in Thailand divided into under two ministry. One group is in the under ministry of culture and another, um, and the Ministry of Education. So we have another meeting with um, the Ministry of Culture at the National Libraries and inform them as well about this is shouldn't happen. And of course, the response was positive. So it was the first time actually that that the association had took this kind of step to talk to the government agencies. Next slide, please. So in Thailand, um, there are the Intellectual Property Association of Thailand, IPAD. Um, this is more or less um, a stakeholder, but most of the active members are lawyers. They used to organize a lot of um, talk and discussion to inform, but not the public. Most people who attend that talk are lawyers and law students. So they not really get into the public as much. And we are trying to talk to them whether we could sort of push it more and inform the public more about um, the importance of copyright and the suits, that kind of thing. So next slide, please. This is a bunch of lawyers faces, you know, I attended the, the last time they were talking about um, the AI, how they've been using AI to distort images. Probably, you know, that it's um, voila, that you make the animation from your photographs and who's owned the copyright of those animated faces and that kind of thing. Okay, next slide, please. So this is a clip of what our IP department has been doing. They're not informed the public. You can play the clip, please. IP for be the pitching Not that I agree with this, but instead of um, provide the straightforward information, they're trying to have this reality show and promote um, what you call the, the creating economy. But as I said it earlier, because our intellectual property de um, department is under Ministry of Commerce, so they're trying to promote products instead of um protected the copyright and um so we we have a little issues with them next slide please i think um in the whole asean uh, the philippines is very interesting that um the the copyright um, department start to really active and start to sort of having um, engaging the public and stakeholders in creative economy and make um, sort of create a lot of the public discussion online during this pandemic, why people cannot traveling or leave their home. So they have the bulletins and they have discussions and so on. So that's, that's what happened in the Philippines. Next slide, please. Well, actually what I miss and I apologize, I should mention Indonesia here. With um, Indonesia have problem with um, pirate copies of books. So um, Ikapi, the Indonesian Publisher Association complained to the government and uh, the Ministry of 
um, tourism and creative economy had created the um, Book Piracy Eradication Task Force. And this one, they tried to um, stop all the um, pirate copy infringement, but they just start, so we don't know the impact has happened yet. And in Malaysia, besides the protests with all the, the e-commerce, they successfully um, registered the RRO in Malaysia. And for Singapore, it's also targeting on online piracy. Um, but all of the ASEAN country, the process, when you complain something, you have to always go back to the police department. And they are not so keen on going after this. And they create a lot of requirement and paperwork. Like if it's online, um, if they sell it online, we're supposed to capture all the, uh, the screen and print it out and submit it to the police. So the, the enforcement is almost impossible for a small publisher or even medium-sized publisher. Um, next slide, please. But um, before you go on, I forget to say that we don't have um, any information from Vietnam and Cambodia or Laos or let alone Myanmar. Myanmar, just forget it. Actually, last year they were about to um, endorse the new copyright law. And Pubat has been talking to um, Myanmar Book Publisher Association to organize the copyright workshop to um, inform and educate uh, Myanmar publishers. But of course, you know, we were set it early this year, but the coup has just changed everything. And, and it's, it's so sad what's happened to Myanmar. So, Back to the ASEAN Book Publisher Association. We formed the Copyright Committee last, in the mid last year to updating members of any development in, within each member and its government, members and the public, and cooperate with the international organizations such as IPA and um, IFRO and all the related matters, you know, but it just starts so it, I hope that we will eventually pick it up and do some work and cooperate it more. And that's is it about ASEAN. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Traspin. Uh, it was very thorough introduction for me to uh, understanding the very uh, diverse uh, the social and cultural context of the copyright issues. Uh, and then uh, controlled by uh, varying uh, ministries. Maybe this, we can say uh, a little bit more about that later. And how this uh, quite uh, similar digital technological context, but why cultural differences would provide something different handling and control issues in, in different countries in ASEAN as well. So uh, it was very uh, uh, informative as well. Thank you very much indeed again. So uh, let's move to the, the third speaker. Um, uh, a presentation by Michael Hilly in New York. Uh, Michael is the Executive Director of International Relations at Copyright Clearance Center. Uh, prior uh, to joining CCC, Michael was Executive Director of the Book Right Registry and previously Executive Director of the Book Industry Study Group, uh, which is a New York-based nonprofit body dedicated to improving <coughs> the efficiency of the book industry by providing standard research, education, and information. Michael has worked in the publishing and information industries for more than 25 years and has spent most of that time in senior editorial sales and distribution roles in digital publishing. So I think this, there is no one is more stable to talk about digital publishing in this uh, era now. Uh, he has been closely involved in the development of the standard for the international book trade and is particularly associated with the standard for metadata, product information, and electronic commerce. Michael has led many international standard groups 
and he was chairman of the International ISBN Agency, a director of the International DOI Foundation, and led the International ISO Committee that developed the ISBN 13, which is all we are familiar now with the, every time that we open up the book <laughs> or read the article. So he is currently a board member of the Copyright Hub Foundation in the UK and chairman of the board of the International Standard Name Identifier. So we are very pleased to have Michael today. So should I start with your presentation, please? Oh, thank you very much for that introduction, Jay. Can you hear me okay? It's very well, thank you. Good. Well, let me begin by thanking my friends at the Korea Publishers Association and the Seoul International Book Fair for inviting me to join this presentation with two old friends, Trasvin and Jose. Uh, it's really nice to be part of this. It's possible, I suppose, that many old people uh, joining today are not necessarily familiar with um, CCC. So just to say a few words about us, uh, we were established uh, more than 40 years ago. We're a non-profit organization and we are technically, I suppose it's fair to say, a collective licensing organization. So our roots are very deeply in um, uh, copyright licensing for corporations and for educational institutions. We're based in the United States with several offices here, but we also have offices around the world in Japan, for example, the United Kingdom, Spain, and elsewhere. Next slide, please. Um, we serve uh, quite a diverse uh, community of organizations, of course, academic institutions at all levels, universities, colleges, and schools, and so on. But primarily, I suppose we're known for providing uh, licensing content and related services to a very large number of corporations around the world. And um, our services have evolved very significantly over the course of the last 40 years, but our roots remain very much in copyright and copyright licensing. And we have supplemented traditional licensing services with a range of other products, including content, as I mentioned, content delivery, software, staffing, and many, many other services. Uh, globally. So if we could go please to the next slide. Well, as Jose and Trasvin has said, um, when we look back on the pandemic year of 2020, what is really striking is how uh, publishers, industry associations, and other partners such as Copyright Clearance Center have come together to try to provide business continuity during an extraordinarily disruptive period. And there are so many examples of how effectively this has worked. For example, in the United States where I'm based, the Copyright Alliance, of which uh, CCC is a member, published online for the public an enormous range of resources provided by the creative communities, the copyright communities, including educational content, entertainment, education, news, and so much more. And this site included links to CCC's own podcast and blog posts and so on. At CCC, we uh, provided what we called open to read COVID-19 content. This was put together, collected, published on our website, copyright.com, and it provided the latest information and links to relevant COVID-19 content available from scholarly publishers and research organizations trying to contribute to the common good at such a difficult time. We launched and developed very quickly a special license for the educational community. We called it the Education Continuity License, and we made that available in the first days of the pandemic. With the lockdowns leading to so much unexpected distance learning and distance teaching, we feel we worked very effectively with publishers to authorize educational use of publishers' content, publishers' materials, at no cost to the user. We created an online hub for teachers and educators to accelerate the sharing and, of knowledge and to help ease online learning during the crisis. 
by making publishers' educational resources open for K-12 and higher education students and teachers. We used our Velocity of Content blog and podcasts and distributed a lot of content through our own social media channels. So, you know, very much uh, consistent with what Jose was saying earlier, um, when we look back on 2020, we're really struck by the very high level of collaboration and cooperation within the publishing community to try and contribute um, to what was an extraordinary difficult situation. And now we find ourselves in 2021, and what's clear to us, at least here in the United States, is that hybrid learning is beginning to look like something that's here to stay. The demand remains constant for high quality materials to supplement the core curriculum and deepen engagement with students. Um, there was a report published in the United States by a well-known uh, research organization, RAND, that was published back in December 2020. And it made very clear that remote learning is not going away, it's here to stay. And there were some really interesting findings. About 20% of the school districts in the United States have either already adopted or plan to adopt virtual schools as part of their portfolio of services going forward, even when the COVID-19 pandemic has ended. And uh, school district leadership has said that there's real demand from students and parents, and that's the basis for continuing with online instruction in future years going forward. I think everybody's aware that um, the government in the United States has provided a number of stimulus packages. They go under different names, but perhaps the CARES Act is the best known. That's the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act. That was a $2.2 trillion economic stimulus bill, which was signed into law. Um, and part of that stimulus effort, part of that relief effort um, is going towards um, upgrading facilities, upgrading technology um, to support distance learning, teacher training, staff training, and you know, remediating some of the worst impacts of COVID within the educational uh, system. So there's been a huge amount of um, support and relief provided by uh, the US government to this very badly affected area. Could we please go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, we've tried to maintain continuity from the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, I mentioned the creation of the education continuity license, but we've also worked very closely with publishers to you know, develop additional innovations and programs that provide educators with easy access to the instructional content they need. In addition to that education continuity license, we have an annual license for curriculum and instruction, which is targeting the K to 12 market. We have um, uh, what we call a student assessment license uh, and so on. So we've, we've, um, feel we've partnered very effectively with the rights holder community um, to step forward at this incredibly difficult time. Next slide, please. We've had um, a long-standing license uh, for higher education, a single license covering institutions campus-wide, so to speak, and that has enabled um, teachers, students to make reuses of millions of text-based information resources. Next slide, please. As I mentioned in my uh, introduction, we're also very heavily involved, not just in licensing reuse, but also in providing content directly. And we have a content delivery service for academic institutions called Get It Now. It's a cloud-based 
uh, content delivery service developed for academic institutions of all sizes. And we hope it's a, a cost-effective way of providing immediate fulfillment services of journal articles, not otherwise available maybe in the institution from their subscriptions. We developed this originally with the California State University System, with Elsevier and other publishers. And today, something like 18,000 journals and tens of millions of articles are made available to higher education institutions in the United States, but also elsewhere for immediate purchase and uh, immediate delivery. Uh, next slide, please. We take also very seriously our role as an educator about copyright. Um, there are, as everybody knows, many, many myths and misconceptions about copyright, particularly, it's fair to say, in the educational community. And we take very seriously, uh, with appropriate investment, um, our mission to educate um, the academic and educational community about what copyright is and what it isn't. We launched, as you can see on the screen, uh, a K-12 copyright education certificate course. Um, it's designed to help build awareness amongst students, amongst teachers, about what copyright is and what content can and can't be used and how it can and can't be used to help schools and districts enhance their uh, copyright compliance, if I can put it that way. Next slide, please. Of course, we don't do this alone. Um, nobody can be fully effective in these extraordinary conditions by working alone. And again, as Jose and Trasvin have emphasized uh, so effectively, a lot of organizations have stepped up during the pandemic to collaborate so effectively. And um, Trasvin mentioned when she was making her remarks earlier about participating in the work of the International Federation of Reproduction Rights Organizations, IFRO. Uh, Copyright Clearance Center has been a member of that organization for a very, very long time. And we're uh, delighted to participate in the work that do, they do. Next slide, please. If you don't know IFRO, and you can go to ifro.org if you're not familiar with it, it's the main um, network of collective licensing bodies. It includes many creators associations, many publishers associations working in the text and image industries. Its job, quite simply, is to protect and serve easy and legal access to copyright material. And um, it is effectively the trade association of collective licensing organizations such as Copyright Clearance Center. It advocates for copyright. It stands up and speaks for copyright and for the creative sector. And it, it does so mainly by supporting and building a strong network that supports the rights of creators and publishers, including their economic and moral rights. Next slide, please. Now, as I've mentioned, um, Copyright Clearance Center here in the United States and in our offices around the world. We have tried during the pandemic, since the pandemic struck, to innovate, to support business continuity, whether it's in the academic sector or in the corporate sector, supporting research, supporting innovation. We are by no means the only organization that's done that. Reproduction rights organizations, collective licensing bodies around the world, as my friends Jose and Trasville will testify, have really stepped forward to work with industry associations to support learning and teaching in this new way in these incredibly challenging conditions. These organizations have done uh, many things, including introduce new licenses. They have changed and modified existing licenses, increasing copying limits, for example, in educational institutions, enabling remote access as they had to 
uh, as teaching and learning went distant and hybrid. Many reproduction rights organizations have tried to support authors and publishers financially. We mustn't forget that many, many authors and many, many publishers have suffered financially during these very, very difficult conditions. And RROs, collective licensing bodies, have tried to step forward and change their payment schedules to get money to authors and publishers in these difficult times more quickly and more efficiently. And I think the international copyright community uh, deserves a lot of credit for the efforts it's made in these areas. Many RROs around the world, they manage social and cultural funds on behalf of the creative communities. And many of them I know have come up with innovative and creative uses of those funds to help offset the hardship that authors and publishers have often faced in these incredibly difficult times. They have worked tirelessly with national publishers associations and with the fantastic work of IPA to lobby nationally and internationally to support the creative sector. And um, I think the profile of the creative sector and the incredible contribution that authors and publishers make to the creative world have been appropriately promoted in these incredibly difficult times. So, uh, and I think the copyright community has played its part fully around the world in that effort. And as I've said uh, on multiple occasions during this short presentation, what we have seen very visibly in the course of the last 15 or 18 months has been a remarkable quality of partnership around the world between authors, between publishers and the educational community, teachers, students, uh, as well as the research community and industry around the world. So um, I don't think any of us uh, feel comfortable or confident or sanguine or complacent about the future of copyright necessarily. But I think uh, the copyright communities and the creative communities have stepped forward during this crisis to remind the world, to remind educators and students, to remind the corporate world what it is we contribute, um, not, not just in difficult times like these, but at all times. And I think that might be my final slide, but could you advance that? I think that's me done. So thank you very much for listening and uh, happy to uh, take any questions there might be. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Uh, it was very uh, inspiring to think about this impact of the digital education, especially this uh, acceleration of distant learning during the pandemic period. There is, a, there is a, 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 some kind of the conflict between there is a possibilities and opportunity to to uh, widen these uh, uh, academic uh, resources, but at the same time, there are massive challenges how we can deal with this uh, effectively, especially the copyright issues as well. As, uh, at the university nowadays, we are really having a difficulty to deal with this at the same time because it's this uh, unprecedented scale in how using this sort of new technologies in our classroom and able to what extent we can actually use some some resources in a proper way without infringing especially with the students and, and the students are also very much challenged by their own education at the same time so it is very uh, helpful to to think about this both opportunity and challenge at the same time so uh, we have a little bit more time to talk about on this, uh, the presentation. So while you are mulling over some uh, the questions to one another, maybe uh, I can start with the first presentation of Jose. It's, uh, it's been, I mean, there are some very common senses about this uh, uh, impact of the digital technology on 
the copyright issues, but it was very uh, uh, striking to see this upside and downside at the same time here in Jose's presentation. Jose emphasized this, that there is a accelerated shift to digital business and market actually showing a significant increase in digital sales in 2020. So, but at the same time, this a massive increase company, the imprintment together. So do you see this, uh, there is uh, some gaps between this uh, technological development and cultural perception about this use of this uh, production? So why there are so constant imprisonments? And I mean, we can expect this uh, digital technology would uh, help the reproduction skills better and the more bigger scale. But, but how does this, uh, the, as you said, this uh, some downside is a digital piracies are also at the same time increasing. So uh, overall this, uh, uh, how we can deal with in terms of digital licensing, what's, what's the most challenging issues this uh, technological development on the digital licensing here? Um, so they're, they're, they're all very interesting questions. The before, before I forget, I want to put on the table the digital divide. Um, we, we may be talking about increased sales. We may be talking about increased penetration of markets by digital books or other resources. Um, but in, in that case, we're talking about the developed world. Okay, we can't forget that there are countries in the world with um, um, negligible um, uh, broadband and other digital coverage. And they're the ones that are being left behind even further. Okay, so the, 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 direction, the direction of evolution was always heading towards um, more digital um, and better digital. Um, and there was a gap and uh, now there's a bigger gap, okay? Because the, um, uh, the developed world has, has seized the opportunity and is uh, marketing their products in many more um, different ways, many of them uh, digital. Uh, but in places in Africa, in Latin America and Asia, that is just not possible. It's just not possible. And education, for instance, still has to uh, be carried out um, uh, using hard copy, okay? Not because hard copy is better. That's another argument. That's another conversation, okay? Because in many cases, hard copy is better uh, if you want to educate certain types of readers. Um, but putting that to one side, the, in many countries, they don't have the choice. Of, of taking hard copy or digital, okay? So let's put that on the table. In terms of what happened last year, I mean, I remember being in a meeting in South America where a leading publisher um, said, this is not too long ago, this before the pandemic, but not too long ago, saying that the biggest challenge for him and the biggest fear and threat for him and his publishing was digital. Why? Because as soon as um, he opened the door to digital, he felt like he was completely and utterly um, uh, out of control, mm -hmm. that piracy would just blossom. So in many countries, it's not even a matter of um, resources. It has been a matter of ideology and um, perception. And uh, I, I don't want to blame this guy who was feeling this way, he was in a country that um, where the government had not put in place mm. the required or the adequate um, measures that would have allowed him to feel confident about putting out a digital product. Mm. So all of these things have been um, exacerbated. All of these things have now uh, taken on their own um, kind of momentum uh, and are heading in many different directions that no one really knows about. One of the things that I'm um, most concerned about is um, when I talked about the copy wrongs. 
The copy wrongs are using this situation where publishers, and let's, let's remember it's publishers, authors, and CMOs who have used the flexibility and the range of copyright legislation to allow for different ways of licensing. It's they that have taken the initiative. They have heard the call from government. So STM publishers have put out all the material, mm. all the material, 100% of the material that had anything to do with COVID was made free, okay? And it wasn't any government putting a gun to the head of the STM publishers. They did it because they knew that it was important to do, okay? So they did that. Education publishers realised that uh, schools were, were locking down. What are they going to do? What are teachers going to do? What are students going to do? Education publishers came up to the plate, to use a baseball uh, metaphor, and did what they had to do ethically, not because they were going to make money out of it, not because they wanted a prize at the end of the day. They did it because they knew it was the right thing to do. And um, other publishers, uh, um, trade publishers, have also come to the party and have increased their um, um, uh, markets for uh, virtual books and online um, uh, markets because they know that people were sitting at home going crazy. Okay, mm. again, it's not a matter of um, making money out of any of this. Like I said, in 2020, the, the, um, um, the gap between what uh, publishers lost because of bookshops being closed and what they gained by increased online sales, there was a gap. So publishers lost money even there, okay? And as um, Michael has um, so uh, eloquently uh, detailed, CMOs also came into, um, into play. And uh, different, different places tried different things, as Trasman has, um, has exemplified. So everybody used copyright to deal with the pandemic and get over it, okay? And now we find copy wrong organisations some of them for their own evil desires, <laughs> evil desires. Others muddle-headedly, they're sucked in to some kind of wacky uh, ideological screed, are saying, let's get rid of copyright. Copyright is clearly uh, not fit for purpose. Excuse me, we've got through it because of copyright. Get off the bus, all right? It's not a, cop, uh, a problem with copyright. It's the very nature of copyright that has allowed uh, authors, publishers, and others in this value chain to give us what we needed when we needed it. And we're still innovating and we're still working forward on that. So that's what worries me. If you're talking about challenges, it's that ideological push for something that is, is actually self-defeating, okay? What they will do if they destroy copyright is destroy the very um, uh, mechanism that has allowed us to keep going and to succeed. Okay, I'll stop there. There endeth the lesson. It was a really, really uh, interesting point. I mean, in, in Korea, we call it this, uh, rather than copy wrong, but it's copy left, right? rather than copy right. No, no but that, we're, we're starting the campaign right now, Jay. It's, it's copy wrong. Copy, copy wrong, exactly. Copy it, you, you touched on a really um, crucial point, and is how these challenges, uh, especially occurring in the educational field, and it is in that, I mean, Christian and then Michael, feel free to jump on. But it's uh, Michael mentioned about this uh, copyright education in classroom and, and on campus as uh, well during this, uh, this period. So how and test your knowledge and questions and learner interactions. But what are, what are the challenges and then and while this uh, educating the copyright issues during this uh, very a, uh, intensive challenge also occurring at the same time. How, how did it go with, uh, in, in your CCC performances there? Well, 
you know, th this is a point that I think Jose made incredibly effectively. You know, just looking at my own personal experience, Jay, um, I have a oldest son at a university in the UK, and I have a younger son in high school in New York. And the transition to uh, distance teaching, distance learning, was very, very difficult for their institutions in two of the most privileged, well-resourced countries in the world. It was not done quickly, smoothly, or very effectively. Mm. So imagine, as Jose has said, what it has been like for our friends in sub-Saharan Africa. I talk to the collective licensing organizations in those countries all the time. I know uh, Jose does too, to publishers. The, the transition just in some cases simply couldn't happen. Universities were closed for long periods, schools were closed because of what he calls so well, the digital divide. Now, um, many of those difficulties were technological in nature. They were human resource, if I can put it that way, in nature. But I can tell you one thing, copyright was not part of the problem. It was not an impediment which was preventing the smooth transition from physical face-to-face -face teaching and learning to distance teaching and learning. It was not anything to do with the perceived inflexibility or imperfections of copyright, imperfections of licensing. There are none in this respect. They copyright licensing worked very, very well in these situations because there was a determination from the creative community, authors, publishers, uh, rights holders of all kinds, to work with educators to find flexible, creative solutions. And um, we can't be complacent now and say that as the world, I hope, moves over the course of the next year or two out of the worst of this pandemic, we can't be complacent that the value of creators, the value of publishers, the value of copyright and licensing is going to be applauded by the communities going forward. We can't take that for granted. As Jose has said, there are people determined to weaken um, copyright uh, for their own purposes. And we see examples of that every single day around the world. And what is, what is at risk here is a failure to, is, is the opportunity to learn and the opportunity um, to understand that in the course of the last 15 months, difficult as that period has been, there has been, as I keep saying, a remarkably creative, remarkably fertile cooperation between educators and creators. And copyright has made that possible. It hasn't been an obstacle. It's been a facilitator. And uh, if, if events like today can help amplify that message, um, I'd be really, really happy because I fear it may be lost as we move out of this period. Exactly. There is uh, this uh, very unprecedented uh, this period really uh, facilitated the, the better partnership between publishers, authors, and creative industries and educators together. Otherwise, because this is so intertwined at the moment, it is, uh, so this, uh, if it works separately, it might be much difficult to handle with this issue as well. Well, thanks for that. I mean, uh, uh, trust me, it was uh, quite related to your presentation in my view, because so you, you uh, uh, well presented the varying ministerial differences handling with this copyright in Asia, and some is on the education, some other, and there's a, a more a trade and business part. So, how, how do you see these differences of uh, this ministerial uh, handling about copyright in different 
ways. What are the what are these uh, the advantages and disadvantages in different institutional uh, handlings here? I think it's more of disadvantage because you see um, all of the Southeast Asian, including Thailand too. You know, it's a very young nation, and the policy at the beginning probably wasn't clear. I mean, when you start to have this new nation. Um, new nation states, let's put it that way. And um, it's depend on what was the urgency at, at that moment, you know, of the state set up. But um, as time grew, and I mean, we have to sort of give a lot of credit to creative industry from Korea too, which and Japan and Korea, you know, later on that was kind of inspired um, this, younger generations and new uh, presented administration. For example, um, you see that in Indonesia, it's very clear example, the in, um, intellectual property is still in the law and human rights ministry, but it's the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy who set up this piracy um, eradication task force different ministry and how they're going to work together, I, I still have no ideas, you know, because um, we are so infamous about, doesn't really um, cooperate with each other. I don't know, Indonesia might be better in, than Thailand, but in Thailand, it would be impossible to have the two ministry working the same issues. And again, then as um, Michael and, and Jose had put it, um, Copyrights um, encourage creati creativities. Without it, then why should people invest in their thinking, you know, if they're going to be pirate, stolen? I mean, you, you're willing to give it away when it's time like this, you know, people are not hard hearted, but, but they need protections. And if the policy makers doesn't help them, and then they expect us to be like Korean, you know, impossible if we're going to get tired all the time in and out. It's not going to work. Books too. And I mean, in Southeast Asia, forget about long distance learning, it doesn't work. We still have this cultural thing that you need teacher and, and student need to sit face to face, you know, and they can't concentrate. This and learning doesn't help and broadband doesn't really always work. This year, actually they have been saying in Thailand that let, let, let cancel school year this year. And people say, no, 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 but we have to find some other way. It's, it's just going to be difficult. And if it's the enforcement end up with crazy police department, and I said crazy because they don't get much helping us, supporting us. There were cases in Thailand, which I was so angry. Actually, I should have captured and that show it to you, but this is quite old. Um, there were one um, TV series, which is so successful. I mean, addictive and of course, it got pirated and downloaded it and things. And they download the books too, read it free, you know. And of course, the publisher went to report and complain to the police. The first thing when the, the, the television channel who produced that series, the newsmaker read it out and said, today the publishers complain about this, blah, 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 blah. So, I warn you, those who already downloaded, you better erase it from your computer, otherwise you will, police will get you. Thank you, thank you very much. I feel like I want to hit that guy head, you know, but it's my own TV, so I don't want to break it. But if he's next to me, I'm going to hit him right away. It's just ridiculous. Are you, instead of sim have sympathy with the victims, they have sympathy with the criminal. I just like, I'm, I'm the only crazy person around here, you know, that I want to hit people all the time. 
<laughs> so violence. <laughs> but it's difficult and it's culturally and you need to perhaps um, Michael was right that we should add it into curriculum. You see that even people in the Ministry of Education, the librarian didn't know. And actually it shouldn't be association job, you know. It's a department of intellectual property, but they are into this show. Exactly. I mean, there is there these complexities of your in the institutional issues that also reflect why copyright issues is not exactly. just one single issue, but involving many different things right. about creativities and then education and then publishing industries. So it, it's centered around the issue of the copyright. Right. It's, yeah. it's all intertwined, as you said, that you just can't separate it one by one. No, it has to come together. And, and the public understanding is the most important thing. They, there were one example many years ago, the IP department that just said, oh, don't copy CDs or music. It's wrong, bang. That doesn't help. You, just, you have to say that, you know, if this factory who produced the producer of this music gone out of business, it might be your family, your friends who lose a job. It affect the whole economy. I have to explain that. But if you fail to explain that it's so, it's your own benefit. Everyone affected from it indirectly. When people said, oh, everything is so good in the Scandinavia, yes, the public pay tax. We're not paying tax and why we want the return, you know, it's, it's give and take. This is something that copyright is about give and take. Of course, yeah, indeed. Well, so, I mean, did we uh, touch base on those, uh, the key issues, but are there anything you would like to uh, add and then say more about these uh, issues? Or we can just a little bit. Let it flow a little bit further. Yeah, I, I think it, it's important to to let um, the entire world know that that you have to change your attitude on copyright. Of course, yeah. It it sounds like you know a lot of people in Southeast Asia think this. No, no, they they they're going to charge us. That, that's not the point. The point is when you like someone, you want to give them flowers, it's exactly the same thing. You have to show appreciations. It doesn't have to be much, but you need to, to respect it. Go on. Go on. Last, one last thing to say. Um, uh, I, I think historically, most of the time, and I think to myself, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, the only people who could afford to be creators, literary creators, uh, were people who had um, a very rich and powerful uh, person giving them money, sometimes giving them a house, sometimes giving them uh, a wage or some kind of benefit. They were the only ones writing. Now, Everybody writes, everybody makes movies, everybody takes photos. There are more photos taken every day than there have been uh, photos taken in the, in the whole of history, okay? Um, uh, Francis Gurry, the, head of the, the previous head of WHO, um, sorry, uh, WIPO, once said that um, this year more uh, creations, more objects will be created than all the objects created in history up till this moment. Now that was three years ago. And I can tell you that every year, it's still the same. It's still true. We're going, we're exploding exponentially in terms of creation. And one of the, I'm not saying that the only reason, but one of the reasons that people can even dream about being a, an author 
can dream about being a musician, can dream about being anything creative, is because of things like copyright. It allows you to invest your time, your life into something and be able to still put food on the table, have a family, have a house, um, jump on a bike and go somewhere. Um, otherwise, it's all gone. So a lot of the people that are um, arguing against copyright don't understand that what they're doing is not just shooting the, go the goose that laid the golden egg, they're cutting it up into little pieces and throwing them into the wind. You know, the, the world without copyright, and I'd be the first one, sorry, I'll, I'll say two things. If there was a better system, if someone can show me a better system so that all creators get a living wage or at least get recompense for their work and all publishers and all like um, uh, organisations, like publishers producing and distributing that, those creations of the mind. If, if you can show me a better system than copyright, I'll be the first one to advocate. Okay, I'll jump off, I'll quit the IPA and I'll start telling people about this new system. I put that challenge down on the table many times. No one, no one, zero, has come up with a better system. Okay, so until you do, let's get on with it. Let's make more. Let's make more people happy with the creations that humans can make. And let's stop all this palaver, these sideshows about um, free, free content um, being the answer. Okay, again, I'll stop. No, so you, Michael, you can say the two things. Uh, can you take on the challenge or the reinforce? Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I just want to add one dimension to something Jose said, which is that there will come soon a day when we go through this pandemic, we've come out the other side of this pandemic. And I think when we look back, we will ask ourselves, who got us to the other side? It was scientists researchers, nurses, doctors, um, clinicians of all kinds. And I hope also credit will be given to those who enabled the research, the scientific findings, the vaccinations, etc., cetera, um, to, be made, to be made available, to be distributed, because at the heart of the scientific and research endeavor is sharing. It's collaboration, it's cooperation. And publishers played such an important part in making research findings uh, available on a collaborative basis. And as the other speakers have said repeatedly in the last hour or so, copyright wasn't an obstacle to that, it was fundamental to making the research, sharing and collaboration process possible. And I really hope that the creative community at the end of this gets appropriate credit along with the scientific, medical and research communities for pulling us out of this difficult situation in the last 18 months. Yeah, I can't agree more than uh, uh... I mean, as Jose uh, aptly pointed out, the copy wrong advocates their, their and justify their practices in terms of the democratization of knowledge, but actually it's a destruction of knowledge at the end. And it's a, so we can see this uh, trend and how dangerous it is as well, and how we can actually copyright should serve as a facilitator of knowledge and the enabler of these academic communities and this actually is an opportunity for the more better creative practices, not vice versa. So I think that's the thing is how we can see this is the more challenging issues about copyright during this period of the pandemic as well. And then we can see that some of the more challenges will come as unfortunately 
this is a pandemic would go. But it's, as it is a global epidemic, so this issue is also now not limited in a very uh, one nation, but it's a very global issue as well. And then only through that global collaboration, these issues could be uh, a little bit reserved as well. I think this is a brilliant talk and it's a really inspiring as well. Oh. On behalf of uh, Seoul International Book Fair, I'd like to express a huge thanks to the presenters for wonderful, inspiring, great talks today. Thank you very much indeed. And I hope you stay very safe and well. Thank you very much and see you again very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. See you all. Thank you very much. It was great. See you, Michael. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.